So my topic today is authorship in a transnational perspective, world literature in the making. Studies on authorship have developed following Foucault's reflections on the author function in his seminal paper, What's an Author? However, because of their interest in the legal aspects highlighted by Foucault, both censorship and copyright, these studies have focused on the national rather than on the transnational scene, comparing, for instance, French and American laws on copyright. It was not until very recently that the issue of the construction of transnational authorship emerged. In this lecture, I would like to connect the question of authorship to that of world literature by questioning the construction of transnational authorship by intermediaries. I am developing here the first reflections I presented on the occasion of the Mackenzie lecture I gave at Oxford last March. The interest for intermediaries developed in the sociology of texts and of publishing. As one of the greatest authorities on bibliography, Donald Mackenzie puts it, sociology, quote, directs us to consider the human motives and interactions which texts involve at every stage of their production, transmission, and consumption. It alerts us to the role of institutions of, and their own complex structures in affecting the forms of social discourse, past and present, unquote. However, historians of the book and of publishing have for long neglected the question of the international circulation of texts, despite, despite the rise of translation studies since the 1970s. This is a side effect of what has been called methodological nationalism. Since the end of the 1990s, however, it has become an important research domain for historians of culture who have combined their efforts with sociologists of literature and intellectual life and with literary scholars. In literary studies, the transnational perspective has also developed since the end of the 1990s, especially around the concept of world literature. Drawing upon field theory, Pascal Casanova's book on the World Republic of Letters became a major reference in this domain, along with Franco Moretti's conjectures on world literature, and of course, David Demmer's essay, What is World Literature? In 1989, Bourdieu gave a talk for the inauguration of the Frankreich Centrum at the University of Freiburg am Riesgau, entitled The Social Conditions of the International Circulations of Ideas. Starting with Marx's uh, observation that, quote, texts circulate without their context, which is a source of misunderstanding, he, Bourdieu, delineated the whole research program on the strategies of importers, that is to say publishers, series editors, translators, critics, academics, and on their struggles over the appropriation and labeling of foreign texts in a given reception field. This text became a reference for developing a sociology of translation and more broadly of the international circulation of symbolic goods. Authorship studies refer to Michel Foucault's seminal article, uh, What is an Author? Foucault argues that before discourse was a product, it was an act that could be punished. The author's appropriation of discourse as his personal property is secondary to its ascription to his name through penal responsibility. In France, the 1551 Chateaubriand edict made it compulsory to print both the author and the printer's names on any publication. Having endorsed this imposed authorship, men of letters would claim, claim it in their struggle to establish their own rights on, to their work and to have literary property defined as an individual property. In 1777, a royal decree recognized literary composition as the product, uh, the product of labor for which authors were entitled to receive uh, an income. This decree reinforced the right of social prestige and status in Max Weber's sense. It can also be regarded as the first stage in the professional development of the literary craft. And I'm using American sociologist Andrew Abbott's concept of professional development rather than uh, uh, the notion of professionalization. Uh, I do it in purpose because uh, um, I want to avoid the teleology that is implied in the notion of professionalization. But still, I, I will keep the, the notion of professionalization when speaking of uh, individual careers. In the Mackenzie lecture he gave in 1997, Roger Chartier, the French historian of the book, revived Foucault's genealogy of literary authorship, placing it in a longer perspective by studying publishing practices which were big, beginning to focus on a single author as early as the 14th century, besides the miscellany books. 
He also pointed to the fact that the literary property granted to authors was closely related to the rights of booksellers. Indeed, booksellers and publishers played a pivotal role in both dimensions of the author function. They fought for the recognition and extension of copyright, which confers monopoly upon a text for a defined period. Publishers are also a central element in the control of publishing, as defined by Paul Fauconnet, uh, the sociologist, uh, document sociologist Paul Fauconnet, legal responsibility or liability results from a historical compromise between two sources of responsibility, objective responsibility and subjective responsibility. So objective responsibility is linked to physical contigu contiguity with the crime, the material uh, involvement with the crime. Uh, and ritual sacrifice uh, is an extreme example of objective responsibility. Um, subjective responsibility is linked to intention, right? Uh, and the extreme example is the condemnation of bad thoughts by religion, even if they are not translated into action. In our legal systems, the, uh, the material relationship between the offender and the crime must be first proven. So you have need the materiality of the crime, and then intention will count as an aggravating circumstance. If we transpose this analytical scheme to literary crimes, we observe that subversive ideas can be condemned only when they are made public, printed, or delivered orally in the public sphere. It is their dissemination that is punished. In France, in the beginning of the 19th century, publishers who by that time were emerging as agents independent from printers and booksellers were held liable uh, for uh, publishing subversive texts. The authors being, uh, when alive, uh, were considered only as their accomplice. This designation of the publishers as responsible for what they disseminate by the 18th and 19th uh, law on the press in France was, of course, a means to control the publication and reprint of works by dead authors, uh, especially the philosophes who com whose complete works were being edited in cheap formats. Uh, so in 1815, reprints represented 45% of the book production. And there were reprints of books like uh, Voltaire, Voltaire's Pucel, Chauderlot de la Clause Liaison Dangereuse, Diderot's La Religieuse, uh, and also Jacques Le Fataliste, were, which were all banned during the Bourbon Restoration. And many titles by the Marquis de Sade were also forbidden. However, the fact that in trials, living authors were always punished more severely than publishers attest to the importance granted to subjective responsibility and also to the strong identification between an author and his text or her text, as well as to the belief in the author's agency and rationality. Thus, there is a tight link between the author's legal responsibility and will, what will be uh, redefined in France in the 1940s as the droit d'auteur, um, the, the author's rights, uh, which defined in France uh, literary property which is different from copyright laws. So the laws on literary property and on freedom of the press circumscribe authorship in society which adopted this legal framework, mostly Western societies. And this legal system frames the international circulation of text through the Berne Convention, to which, however, not all countries applied. I will get back to this point. Beyond the legal system, a historical sociology of authorship needs to take into account the chain of intermediaries and transnational at, uh, both at the national and uh, transnational uh, levels. So all the inter intermediaries that participate in the construction of authorship and uh, authority. And this will be the focus of the first part of my lecture. The second part will be dedicated to the conditions which favor the emergence of a transnational literary field and the factors that favor or hinder its unification. The examples will be drawn mainly from the French case, case which I know the best, uh, but I hope they will make you think of examples from other countries and cultures. So a sociology of authorship demands that we study the role of intermediaries in the production and the circulation of an author's work in the and in the production of its value. As you know, in the art market, for instance, artists are rated, so we don't have the equivalent in the literary field, but still there is a kind of a, uh, implicit rating of the uh, authors. And also um, the, the, the role of intermediaries in the professional development of the literary craft. This applies not only to the national field, but also to the transnational one, although there are some specificities of the transnational circulation, which I, I will point out. 
I will first examine production, then reception, and lastly professional development, considering what happens when we switch from the national to the transnational level. I will leave aside here uh, an important question, that of the author's strategies when they focus from the national to the transnational field, and this would uh, uh, necessitate a whole uh, uh, development in itself. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. So production. With regards to the production uh, process, a sociology of authorship calls for the study of how publishers and since the interwar period literary agents contribute to the making of the figure of the author, her reputation. Publishers and editors often take part in the production of the text itself through revisions, copy editing, and choosing uh, the title. Sartre's publisher, Gaston Gallimard, proposed La Nausée as a title instead of the author's initial idea which was melancholia. One can ask what the image of Sartre as an author would have been had he kept his first title. Titles are also an uh, issue in translation, and they often change. For instance, André Mackin's Le Testament Français was translated in English as Dreams of My Russian Summer, so erasing the French reference and highlighting the Russian one. The international circulation of literary works often involve the translation of the text, which raises interesting questions for the discipline of bibliography, since we have different books and texts referring to one of them as a source. Translation is a paradigmatic example of uh, Mackenzie's statement that text should be regarded as potential rather than a fixed artifact. The value of the work in translation does not only depend on the, quality of the qualities of the original text, but also on the quality of the translation. The publisher has a responsibility in this matter. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so as I said, the, the value of the work in translation does not only depend on the qualities of the original text, but also on the quality of the translation. The publisher has a responsibility. He chooses the translator and edits the translated text. However, in, the, in this case, the translator becomes a major player in the circulation and production of an author's value. Some uh, say that it was thanks to the translator Madeleine Neige that the Israeli writer David Shachar achieved so much recognition in France in the 1980s. The reputation of a translator brings added value to the book, especially in the case of retranslations, as illustrated by Lydia Davis' retranslation of Proust or Madame uh, Bovary. On the cover of the book uh, of the translation of Madame Bovary, uh, you find blurbs uh, of uh, saying that, uh, for instance, Rick Moody, the, the writer, says that uh, David's, um, Davis is the best pro stylist in America. So it's a way to, of course, um, value her translation of uh, Madame Bovary through the achievement of her translation of Proust. Translators have been recognized as authors of their translations only recently. However, translations undertaken by a famous writer or poet sometimes count as part of their own body of work, such is the case of Baudelaire's translations of Edgar Allan Poe, which were included in, his, in Baudelaire's complete works. Much has been done in translation studies to analyze and compare translation strategies and norms of translation, which vary from one culture to another. We can add that they also vary from one period to another and from one sector uh, to another. For instance, the norms of faithfulness that prevail in upmarket literature and academic works do not apply to the lowbrow literary products such as sentimental novels or crime fiction. In youth literature, changing the names, eye, color, and, um, color of, hair, of the hair and color of the eyes, for instance, uh, still is common adaptive practice. In translation studies, this is defined as domestication strategy. However, when I interviewed the editor in charge with youth literature at Gallimard, the most prestigious French publisher, how, publishing house, she said that for the Harry Potter series, the norm of faithfulness uh, to the original text was applied. So this indicates that uh, there is a differentiation between upmarket youth literature and um, uh, more commercial uh, l l products. Uh, so in the upmarket youth literature, you can see that literary norms are applied. The norm of direct translation, mean, meaning uh, direct translation from the original language, also prevails in the upmarket sector, uh, while indirect translation 
from a different language than the original one is much more common in youth fiction and in popular genres. In some cases, the lack of linguistic skills is uh, uh, in a given language make, make it necessary to resort to indirect translation. For instance, there seem to be no translators from French uh, into Hindi. There, there are in Tamil, but not into Hindi. And the French government uh, bodies, the Centre National du Livre uh, and the, um, the Institut Francais, who offer grants for the translation of works written in French in other languages, refuse to allocate their subsidies when the work is not translated from the French. So you can see that in this case, the state participates in establishing and reinforcing uh, the upmarket norm. Nevertheless, there are cases when an author considers the translation of his work as the reference text. It happened with the French translations of novels by the Spanish writer Manuel Vasquez Montalban, as well as the translation of books by the Albanian novelist Ismail Kadare. And he was able to check the translation and to, to, to verify them, and then this became the, the, the reference text. Thanks to the moral rights that are in an inalienable part of the droit d'auteur, contrary to the American com copyright law, uh, there, uh, where they can be assigned to the publisher, it is the author who decides which version serves as the reference and he can ask for uh, control over the translation. So I found letters written by Elsa Morante about the French translation of her novel, L'Isola d'Arturo, in Gallimard's archives. She complained about interpretation errors, misunderstandings and sloppy mistakes on every page and about the way the dialogues were dealt with she succeeded in getting the translation revised by a writer of her choice, Michel Arnaud. After having examined the first translation, Arnaud came to the conclusion that while this translation seemed correct, uh, with some, quote, weaknesses that would be easy to rectify, Elsa Morante's style, as well as her chosen vocabulary, had been very rarely respected, unquote. So the, 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 to sum up, the, the two translators, he said, had simplified the text, omitted words that were admittedly hard to translate, modified the rhythm of the sentences, and uh, as a result, the French version did not render, he said, the colors of the uh, original. Not only does the text often circulate in a la different language, but the integrity of the work, uh, another norm of upmarket uh, um, translation, can be altered by cutting passages either for economic consideration or for moral and political uh, or religious or uh, political reasons through censorship or uh, baudelarism. So Emile Zola's novels Nana and Peeping Hot uh, and also The Soil were self-censored by his British translator and publisher. But this did not prevent the ban against them, uh, nor did it impede the conviction of his publisher, Henri, Vi Henri Visitelli, uh, who was sentenced to prison. Thus, in translation, like in the case of dead authors, the publisher bears alone or with the translator the objective and subjective responsibility for the publication. However, since translation, which respects the International Convention on the Droit d'Auteur, does imply the author's agreement, uh, it may also involve the author's responsibility in her own country. For this reason, publishers in Western countries who translated works by opponent writers in communist regime, where, uh, whether banned or not, did not make them sign an agreement. And they would pay them clandestinely, so they get an oral agreement, but they would not make them sign a contract in order to uh, make sure that they are not uh, um, uh, sanctioned uh, in their own country for having signed uh, an agreement with the Western publisher. So they were overturning the, the, the transgressing the law on, uh, uh, on copyright in order to protect the, the, the author. Beyond the author's reputation and uh, the editing uh, and translating of the text, the, what Roger Chartier calls the mise en livre, uh, I don't know how to translate it, putting into, in, in a book, uh, uh, and also what is called in publishing the packaging, also has an impact um, on the framing of the reception. Uh, while the presentation of the author on the back cover and in other promotional materials shape her Im image in the public sphere. Packaging is still very much anchored in cultural traditions. It would be interesting to compare systematically the covers of the same translation in the United Kingdom and in the United States. So you have an example here of uh, Marine Diaz, Three Strong Women. You have the cover by Knopf and the cover by uh, uh, McLehose. 
and of course the, the cover by uh, Gallimard. And uh, both pu publishers from the two countries, uh, the UK and the US, considered that the other is totally ugly and uh, vulgar and uh, <laughs> Literary agents, when representing authors, uh, enhance their symbolic capital. Whereas Faulkner's international reputation can be in large part attributed to the prestige of his French publisher, Gallimard, who decided to continue investing in this author despite poor sales because he believed in the value of his work, the correspondence between Gallimard and Faulkner's uh, agent in France, William Bradley, reveals the latter's role in building Faulkner's reputation. In a letter uh, dated July 1932, Bradley replied to Gallimard, uh, who, having uh, acquired the rights of, uh, for As I Lay Dying and of Sanctuary, was asking for an option for uh, On Light in August, that he was willing to reserve him the option, but he asked for time limit, quote, since it is not in Mr. Faulkner's interest nor in yours to delay the publication of the new book of such an important author. Other intermediaries play uh, a role, such as the authors of prefaces or postfaces. Uh, in France, during the interwar period, publishers invited famous writers to pen preface, prefaces in order to introduce the French public to a foreign author. These prefaces performed a transfer of symbolic capital uh, from the French authors to the foreign ones. For instance, in the early, early 1930s, Gallimard asked Drieux La Rochelle and Malraux to write prefaces for the French translation of Hemingway's F A Farewell to Arms uh, and Faulkner's Sanctuary, respectively, uh, who were both at the time unknown authors in France. So it sounds funny because today Hemingway is much more uh, uh, well known than, um, than uh, Drieux La Rochelle, of course. Uh, and Malraux, in his preface, defines sanctuary as, uh, quote, the intrusion of Greek tragedy in the crime novel, thus presenting this work as both innovative, thanks to the way it mixes apparently incompatible genres, and universal, given the way it refers uh, classical tradition. As this example shows, the paratext also contributes to categorizing the text according to genre. In this case, we have crime fiction and tragedy, Literary tradition, uh, Greek in this example, schools, movements, trends, for instance, romanticism, realism, surrealism, magical uh, realism. Today, we don't have any more these prefaces, but uh, blurbs fulfill a similar function, although in a more superficial uh, manner. Now to reception. Well, in the production process, the agent, publisher, translator contribute to framing the reception of the work and the making of the author's reputation and image. Other actors uh, come into play in the reception proce process. At what Bourdieu calls the pole of small scale circulation of the literary field, uh, the, um, this is the upmarket segment, what the, the agents of the field call the upmarket segment as opposed to the commercial segment. Um, the critical reception in the media may condition the book's very existence in the public, public sphere and is an important step in the production of its value. At the commercial poll, we don't have a, a critical reception. This is all the more true of the reception of foreign authors who are also more vulner vulnerable to censorship, as we saw with Zola. But the publication of a work in another country, whether in its original language or in translation or both, can also be a way to circumvent censorship in one's own country, as the, case, uh, the cases of Henry Miller and William Burroughs illustrate. Both of them had their sulfurous works first published in English in Paris by Olympia Press. There are also many examples of authors published abroad while they were banned in their own countries for political reasons, one of the most famous being Boris Pasternak's Dr. Givago, uh, translated in Italian and published by Feltrinelli in 1957, and then translated into French and published by Gallimard the following year. That year, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. And also, uh, Kundera was first translated into French legally before being banned in his country, and his manuscript continued to be translated into French, uh, though they did not appear in Czech. Um, and he even won the Medicis Prize in 1973. And these translations uh, and rewards allowed him to earn a living as a writer during, during the period he was banned in his own country, uh, before he immigrated to France uh, and also switched to French language uh, as uh, his writing language. 
A common way for critics to enhance an author's symbolic capital is to compare him or her to writers uh, of the literary word canon. For instance, the Israeli writer Shachar, I mentioned him already, was branded in Le Monde des Livres by an influential critic Jacqueline Piatier as an oriental Proust. I picked up uh, this quote uh, from the review of Marine Diaz's Three Strong Women in the New York Times. But as we're sucked into the downward spiral of Rudy's workday and gradually learn more about the sinister sequence of events that draw him from Senegal, we realize that he, we have entered the head of a paranoiac worthy of Dostoevsky's underground man and one of Thomas Bernard's embittered monomaniacs. <coughs> And you can see also this blurb uh, from the cover of the English translation of uh, Pierre uh, Michon, uh, a contemporary French writer, uh, who was translated by uh, Archipelago in 2008, his, his book uh, titled, entitled Small Lives. Uh, so uh, so I, I won't read it, but you can read it, but you can see he compares uh, Michon to Rimbaud. And in American presentations of new authors, one often finds nowadays expressions like Joyce Smith's Marcus, you know. <laughs> However, uh, their text, I, I didn't find this one, I'm not sure it exists, but. <laughs> 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 However, uh, with their texts circulating independently from them, foreign authors are often instrumentalized in local struggles and in strategy, strategies designed to subvert the power relations structuring the field of reception. Sartre's article, uh, uh, Sartre's, sorry, uh, critical reviews of Faulkner and his lectures mentioning him renewed the space of possibilities within the French literary field. The uh, writer from the nouveau roman, Michel Butor, who would become uh, a key figure of this movement by the end of the 1950s, recalls he heard about Virginia Woolf, Dos Passos, and uh, Faulkner for the first time in a lecture that Sartre gave in the fall of 1944, entitled Une technique sociale du roman, and that, uh, quote, a large part of the problematization of uh, my own novels developed from the reflection that came to my mind during this talk, unquote. And as Pascal Casanova remarked, uh, Juan Bennett uh, discovered Faulkner through the special issue uh, Sartre's journal uh, Les Temps Modernes uh, devoted to, to Faulkner. A positive evaluation by uh, critics can be uh, confirmed by literary prizes, which enhance an author's reputation. At the very moment when national literary prizes were developing, for instance in France, the Goncourt Prize was first awarded in uh, 1903, immediately followed by the Femina Prize, because the prize was also, of course, only uh, uh, um, given by men to men. Um, so uh, followed the creation of the Femina Prize, um, but they had to also consecrate men, because otherwise they would, it's a jury of women, but they have to consecrate men, otherwise they will be too margin marginalized. So uh, at, the, at, the, at that very time, uh, an international literary prize was created, the Nobel Prize, which had a significant impact on the world market of translations and consequently on the national publishing fields. I, I will discuss this later. So the creation of literary prizes for foreign literature is a direct expression of the internationalization of the literary field and of the growing importance of translation. In France, the Prix du Meilleur Livre Étranger was created in 1948. In 1970, the Medicis Prize also started awarding a prize for translated novels. And in 1980, and we saw the example of uh, uh, Shahar, and in 1985, uh, the Femina Prize followed uh, suit. And now there is the uh, prize that is uh, uh, attributed by the, um, the American Pen, Pen Club for, to, for, for translation. Like the Nobel, uh, albeit to a lesser extent, these prizes enhance the reputation of authors not only in the reception field, but also in one's original national field. This impact is all the more significant when it is awarded by a prestigious jury in a central country and when the author comes from a peripheral country. For instance, when the Israeli writer Zoya Shalev was awarded the Femina Prize last year, her success was covered extensively uh, by the Israeli media. However, the status of translated authors in their own countries can be different than in the country of reception. For instance, you may know that Polo Ster is much more recognized in France than in the United States. 
David Shachar, who won the prestigious Medicis Prize for foreign literature, did not enjoy the same uh, consecration in Israel, partly because he was a right-wing intellectual, a fact that was not perceived uh, clearly by the French. Um, Reception also differs from one country to another. Jean-Philippe Toussaint is a star in Japan, where some of his books sell up to 40,000 uh, copies, which is uh, a lot there uh, for translation, uh, especially from the French. Uh, while he is hardly known in the US, though some of his work has been translated here, I'm sure no, 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 no one here, has, apart from Tristos, <laughs> heard uh, about him. This, is also, uh, ha this also has to, to do, of course, with the publisher in the country of reception. Toussaint is published in the US by Dalke Archives, a not-for-profit not publishing house with a small-scale circulation. The reception uh, of works also takes place in private or public gatherings, such as reading clubs and literary events. Public literary events Book fairs and festivals often implicate the author in the reception process through public readings, debates about the text, performances with other artists, musicians, choreographers, videographers. These performances have been described by a French festival organizer as live literature, like live music, live literature, in contrast with the solitary experience of reading. Since the 1980s, the term festival has come to designate public events uh, where literary works are read, commented upon, and discussed by specialists, authors, critics, publishers, and translators. The Times Shettleman, the first festival of uh, literature in Europe, was founded in 1949, but for a long time remained the only one of its kind. In France, book festivals appeared uh, at the margins of the literary field uh, for genres such as comics and crime fiction, First, now they have developed for uh, uh, upmarket literature. In the United Kingdom, the Edinburgh International Book Festival and the High on Y, uh, Hay on Y Festival of Literature uh, and the Arts, initially dedicated to poetry, were created in the 1980s. Events like these multiplied, you can see the list here, uh, by the end of the 1990s. And, and I, would, I won't read the whole uh, list. Um, just uh, an example of the Pen Word Voices, uh, a festival that was launched in 2005 by the American Pen Club under Salman Rushdie's uh, uh, presidents in order to promote translation in the United States in the context of disinterest uh, for translation. The, the rate of translation had fallen to 3% of the book uh, production in the United States. And the American Pen Club, uh, in alliance with uh, small publishers and uh, translators, wanted to uh, value, to revalue, and they called it international literature, which was uh, more uh, uh, prestigious than uh, translations, uh, a term that was considered as uh, devaluing uh, the books. And uh, so I, I won't read, but you can see the presentation of the festival uh, uh, by the, the director uh, for the last edition. These gatherings appeal to a wide audience. Um, so uh, same thing, I won't, uh, you can see the figures here uh, for uh, uh, Festival America in Paris, uh, for uh, High on Y, for Etonnant Voyageur, uh, for uh, Brooklyn Book Festivals. Unlike other types of, uh, um, of events, such as book fairs, uh, which have a more commercial objective and where authors are used as a means to promote the book, mainly through book signings, festivals organizers conduct a specific reflection on the presentation of new works and on how to put authors on display. Intermediaries, commentators, critics, translators, interpreters, and others such act as actors and musicians, actors who read the, uh, the text and the musicians, are assigned a significant role in the presentation uh, of these works and of the author, along with the participation of the author. So it's the, the author in person and the, the body of the uh, author which participates in creating his or uh, her own image. Although it is supposed to bring the author closer to the public, in fact, these meetings uh, uh, reinforce the sacralization of uh, the author. Beyond this mediating function, festivals have come to play a role in the recognition and legitimation of both debut and more established authors. Indeed, an invitation uh, to an event increases uh, a debut author's chances uh, of further invitations and of uh, attracting the attention of critics 
uh, according to what uh, American sociologist Robert Merton called the Matthew effect. The more you are invited, the more you're invited, the more you're translated, the more you're translated. So there's a concentration around uh, a few uh, figures, right? Um, this is true also of criticism. The more you are reviewed, the more you are reviewed. So now to uh, professionalization or professional development. More and more, literary, uh, more and more literary events participate not only in the symbolic recognition of an author, but also in his or her professionalization. For novelists, unlike poets and playwrights, publishing with a professional publisher is the first step in the process of professionalization. In the absence of a diploma or formal training, publishers have historically monopolized the position of the gatekeepers of the literary field. In the past, publishers shared this role with newspapers, which were published serialized novels and uh, uh, short stories, as well as with literary journals, uh, which were crucial in the legitimization process. In the Anglo-American book market, publishers tend to be replaced by literary agents, but agents still sell rights to the publishers. Authors are invited to literary events to present their published books, and their oral interventions are conceived of as a byproduct, discussing or performing the work by reading it out loud, uh, alone or with another artist. Uh, it's not like in the, the oral tradition where the, the, the creation was the uh, oral presentation, right? So it's the reading of a, a written text. For poetry, it's a bit different, but uh, uh, for novels, it's cr clearly, and you read only part of the book, uh, an extra, uh, an excerpt uh, of the book. So this demonstrates the prominence achieved by publisher in the literary field, excluding or marginalizing oral expression. Being published by a professional publisher is also a condition for access uh, to the societies uh, of authors and uh, uh, professional organizations. Most of them reject self-published authors, although a change may currently be underway. Uh, for instance, I interviewed the head of the Société des gens de lettres, uh, the, the French uh, uh, authors, uh, Society of Authors, uh, who told me uh, that she was considering including uh, now uh, self-published authors, but that's really very new, very recent. Societies of authors emerged in the 19th century to promote the interests of writers in the context of the rise of capitalism in the print industry. In 1838, uh, Honoré de Balzac and Louis Desnoyers founded the Société des gens de lettres in order, in order to extend uh, literary property to newspapers. It applied to books, but not to newspapers, uh, and also to establish professional ethics for writers. Because of the hegemony of French uh, literature at the, in the world at that time, uh, in the World Republic of Letters, the Société des gens de lettres served as a model for other countries to create similar, to create similar uh, societies uh, of authors. So these societies of authors and professional associations were national and they multiplied in the first half of the 20th century. In 1878, however, the Association Littéraire et Artistique Internationale uh, was created in Paris at the instigation of Victor Hugo in order to establish an international convention for the protection of writers and artists' rights. It was accomplished eight years later in 1886 with the Berne Convention. Another international association appeared in the interwar period, the Pen Club, uh, which aimed at pacifying international relations after the war through the promotion of cultural exchange. These organizations, were co uh, which contributed to the unification of a transnational literary field and to the formation of transnational literary networks, were still based on national representation. While the Berne Convention on Literary Property was progressively adopted by more and more countries during the first decades of the 20th century, the author's professional status depended on nation states, like the organization of other professions. In France, during the interwar period, writers gained a series of social benefits, the extension of literary property over time and the right to housing, but it was only after the Second World War that they obtained social security and a specific fiscal status uh, until a social status of the author was created in 1977. Testifying to the recognition of the status of the author by the state, a policy of financial support for literary writing was implemented by the government with the Caisse Nationale des Lettres, founded for the first time in 1930. It was replaced in 1973 by the Centre National des Lettres, which was reoriented to become a central body of the newly founded book policy. And more and more, this policy was reoriented toward the, the help to publishers. 
So it would be interesting to compare the author status in different countries, the, also the, the social and uh, fiscal status. Uh, however, the publishers have absorbed most of the aid dedicated to literature. Um, the interesting evolution, uh, recent evolution, is while the aid, the, the support was reserved to French authors, the criteria was modified in 1993 by a decree which stated that financial support could be granted to uh, uh, writers uh, writing in French, uh, which uh, included, of course, francophone authors published uh, in France. So you did not need to have French nationality anymore. Uh, you do not need uh, to, to get uh, support from the French uh, government. Uh, so the, the, the language replaces the uh, nationality as a criteria for uh, defining what is French literature. Now, briefly, uh, the uh, transnational literary field. Is this the so in this part uh, of my talk, I shall focus on the emergence of a transnational literary field and on the factors that favor or hinder its unification. I, shall, I, I will distinguish the, um, the book market from the literary field as defined by Bourdieu. Uh, the, the, the literary field uh, depends partly, of course, on the, uh, on the book market, but the literary field has its own rules, criteria, and authorities. Uh, authorities such as the Nobel Prize uh, is a specific authority of the literary field and not of the book market. The unification of the market can be understood through the notion of isomorphism. As analyzed by neo-institutional sociological theory, isomorphism results from three types of mechanism. Uh, so I refer here to DiMaggio, Paul, Paul DiMaggio and Walter Poe's the theory of, uh, uh, of uh, isomorphism. Uh, constraint, imitation, and professional norms. So they've, they've been working on corporations. Uh, but we can see that these mechanisms apply to the conditions of production of cultural goods. Uh, constraints act as the main homogenizing instrument in authoritarian regimes. The canon of socialist realism was in large part imposed on uh, the other communist regimes by the USSR. Imitation is typical of competitive free markets. Publishers will give preference to works already selected by their peers in other countries in order to reduce uncertain, uh, uncertainty. Despite the fact that, as we saw, uh, the reception is very different from one country to another, and they, they know this very well. The, they say this in interviews. Um, professional norms spread uh, around the world by way of professional organizations such as the Publishers International Union, which is tied to the National Publishers Unions, or the Pen Club, uh, which has local sections in each country. And of course, dominant countries are more likely to impose their norms to, uh, to the others. Literary agents also contribute to harmonizing the professional norms of the national publishing fields. These norms may, may vary within the field of publishing between the pose of large-scale and small-scale production. For instance, we saw uh, already the issue of faithfulness to the original work and direct translation, two norms that have become widespread in the upmarket publishing and which do not apply in more commercial genres as uh, we saw. The norms of upmarket publishing clearly stem from the literary and academic fields where originality has been a central value since the Romantic period. I would like to argue that originality is a principle of differentiation that counterbalances the tendency towards isomorphism in the creative industries. The principle of originality applies not only to the work of the cultural producer recognized, recognized as a creator, but also to publishing. A literary publisher has an identity and functions uh, like a brand name which labels certain kinds of products. Uh, for example, some publishers play the role in gathering literary movements, such as the Nouveau Roman around uh, Edition de Minuit, or Charpentier for the Naturalist. The significance of publishing brand names uh, in the world market is related to their symbolic capital, uh, which is to say the, the, the renowned authors, their Nobel Prize winners, and so on. I have, for instance, conducted the research on how Gallimard established itself historically as an authority in the transnational literary field, and Gallimard uh, preserved its symbolic capital during the globalization era, uh, despite the decline of France uh, and French literature in the uh, World uh, uh, Republic of Letters. Um, 
So you can see that uh, between 1990 and 2003, 29% of literary works translated from French into English and published in the United States were originally published by Gallimard. So that's a lot, they, they concentrate a lot. And 45% of the titles in translation uh, published by Gallimard were by contemporary authors. So it, would, it means that the prestige of its past authors counts just as much as its ability to brand new authors uh, on the international scene. And you can see that uh, Le Seuil arrived far uh, uh, behind with 7% of translated titles, just ahead of Minuit, uh, who with 5% surpasses Grasset. It is worth noting that the representation of publishing houses is not proportional to either their say, size, age, or turnover. Minuit and POL are two small publishing houses whose share, uh, shares are equivalent to larger, older publishing houses such as Grasset or Ab Alba Michel. It is the literary reputation of the pole of small, at the pole of small-scale production that seems to be the determining factor and not the size of the, of the corporation, of the firm. Imitation occurs neither mechanically nor randomly. Publishers tend to follow the choices of some of their foreign peers rather than others. Elective affinities express identities and thus distinct, distinction. The principle of distinction also applies to nation, nation states which all claim to have a national literature. The long-lasting prominence of the national as a category of literary classification, despite, despite the globalization process and despite the emergence of multinational corporations and the growing isomorphism at the pole of large-scale production of the transnational field of publishing, is revelatory of this differentiation logic. Finally, appropriation, which is never mechanical and cannot be reduced to mimicry, also introduces a differentiation through hybridization of genre and cultural traditions, as pointed out by Apadurai, Omibaba, and uh, others. Let's now consider the emergence of the transnational field in a historical perspective. Print allowed uh, for the emergence of a transnational book market wherein texts circulated mostly outwards from the centers, London, Paris, Leipzig, to the peripheries in the dominant languages, Latin, then French. The Bible was the first bestseller in translation. Some little literary works were translated in vernacular languages. Uh, the Decameron was translated into English in a self-censored version, missing novel 10 of the third day and novel 10 of the ninth day. Uh, some translations contained parts uh, in Italian or in French. A translation of the full text did not appear uh, until 1886. After 1850, uh, translation became the main mode of international circulation of books in close relation to the nationalization of culture. As noted by Benedict Anderson, the printing industry was instrumental in the construction of national identities. The newly born nation states adopted an official language that was imposed at, um, at school. The development of printing in the national languages accompanied the democratization of the access to reading through general education. Well, in the first half of the century, Balzac's work uh, had been read uh, by European elites in French. In the second half, Zola's novels reached a much broader audience in translation, often through serial publication uh, in the newspapers. In 1867, the Italian publisher Treves launched a literature series meant for broad audience, which until 1916 uh, included translation of, translations of 136 French works, among them Balzac, Flaubert, Maupassant, uh, Anatole France, Zola, Bourget, 75 English, 45, uh, 44 German, and 34 Russian works, attesting to the dominant position of French literature uh, at that time, but also to the growing importance of other languages in the transnational literary field, English, German, and Russian. Translation also played a crucial role in the formation of national literary and publishing fields. By constituting a corpus of texts, it helped standardize national languages, in some cases well before an indigenous production of texts in these languages developed. Translation also provided literary devices and models for writing modern fiction, as uh, Itamar Evenzoar has shown. The unification of the international book market was fostered by the Berne Convention on Literary Property, which imposed professional norms in publishing. While countries were joining it, excluding many poor and or colonized areas, the creation of the Nobel Prize marked the autonomization of a transnational literary field from the law of the market. 
Nobel Prize winners were translated in other languages. Works by uh, Rabin Dranat Tagore, Thomas Mann, Sinclair Lewis, Ivan Bunin, and Luigi Pirandello were immediately translated into French and other languages, fostering the isomorphism of the translation segment of the national literary fields in the context of the cultural competition between European countries. However, one could also consider that being translated into French had an impact in winning the Nobel Prize, given the dominant position occupied by France in the transnational literary field at the time. Authors like Pirandello were translated in French before they were awarded the Nobel Prize. And it was also the case after the Second World War with uh, authors like uh, Heinrich Böll and Günter Grass. During the interwar period, in the context of intensified cultural exchanges, translation became organized in book series that were separated from French productions. These series were sometimes subdivided according to the country of origin. National identities were indeed, along with genre, the main categories of classification in the upmarket sector. And it was much less the case for popular literature that also circulated across countries. In the prevalence of national identities, uh, sorry, the, the prevalence of national identities was partly due to the intermediaries' linguistic skills. These intermediaries also produced anthologies and panoramas for foreign literatures. Uh, the small publisher Kralu Sagittaire published anthologies of American, German, and Spanish literature, edited and introduced by critics specializing in these literatures. The Noel and Steel also launched a series of contemporary foreign novelists, edited by the critic Georges Charançol, and which included volumes on American, Italian, and German novelists who were introduced to French literary scene uh, through this channel. Journalists would also dedicate special issues uh, to uh, foreign authors from a specific country or a language. The most translated works from, formed the new canon of world literature, as argued by uh, Casanova. This canon of modern literature in vernacular languages progressively replaced the, the classical Greek-Latin canon, which continued to be dominant on the world market uh, of translation until the Second World War, as Daniel Milo uh, demonstrated. Authors like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Horace, uh, Plutarch, Seneca, Plautus, and Tacitus, uh, who were among the 60 most translated authors at the beginning of the 1930s, according to the UNESCO Index Translationum, disappeared from this list after the Second World War. Plato was the only one who survived. Uh, they were replaced by Tolstoy, Dickens, uh, Dostoevsky, and Balzac, to quote only those most consistently on the list of the 30 most translated writers. The new canon was limited to European uh, literature, apart from a few exceptions, such as the Indian Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore. In the 1950s, uh, UNESCO launched a program in support of translations from non-Western cultures in order to catalyze literary interpenetration. This program encouraged editors and publishers to start translating classical and modern works from Asia and Latin America, expanding the borders of the international market of translations from Europe to the world, uh, although whole areas like sub-Saharan Africa were and are still excluded from this market. For instance, in France, uh, at Gallimard, which had been, become the most prestigious publisher, Roger Caillois, who held the position at UNESCO, launched the book series La Croix du Sud, where he published uh, Borges. And the sinologist René Thiam created a literary series uh, titled Connaissance de l'Orient uh, in 1953, where he translated classics, but also contemporary works from uh, Asian uh, cultures. So the, the, the result of this broadening of the geographic horizon of the market of translation beyond the European exchanges was the emergence of non-Western authors in the transnational field. A boom of Latin American literature occurred in Europe in the 1960s, 70s, following Borges' international consecration and due in part to the political events there. Uh, as the, 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 no, the list of Nobel Prize winners points to, uh, we have uh, Miguel Angel Asturias in 1967, Pablo Neruda in 1971, G Gabriel Garcia Marquez in 1982. And also uh, the Asian uh, literature in, in 1968, there was uh, the Japanese writer uh, Kawabata who was awarded the Nobel Prize, which marked the recognition also of Japanese uh, literature. Although colonialism had expanded to the French, British, and German linguistic areas, it took more time for authors from the former colonies to access the transnational field. 
post-colonial authors had to develop specific strategies for attracting critical attention, as analyzed by Graham Hagen, who speaks of the post-colonial exotic. It was not before the 1980s that African authors became visible on the international literary scene. Uh, Wallace Yinka was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1986. Three, year prior, uh, three years prior, the Académie Française, the oldest French literary institution, co-opted the Senegalese poet Leopold Sedar Senghor. In 1987, a Francophone Arab author, Tara Benjeloun, won the French Goncourt Prize for the first time and became one of the most translated Francophone writers in the US between 1990 and 2003. However, despite a very rich literary tradition and important contemporary production, the only Arab writer who won the Nobel Prize to date was uh, Naguib Mahfouz in 1988. Moreover, the rise of non-Western authors conceals the phenomenon of centralization of the transnational market around Western cities. The access of works to the transnational literary field is mediated by authorities in the linguistic area, that is to say central publishers. As shown by Claire Ducourneau, African authors who get attention on the international scene are those published in Paris. Same thing for Latin American authors, those that are published in Spain are those who gain uh, uh, attention, and also uh, Indian authors, uh, those who are published by uh, uh, British uh, publishers, are those who uh, gain uh, visibility on the transnational scene. Thus, the centrality of the publisher is a condition of access to the world literary canon. Prestigious prizes also increase the author's chance to be translated. Um, 14 out of uh, the 20 Goncourt Prize winners between 1990 and 2009 found a publisher in the United States. Marie Ndiaye had previously been translated by a small publisher, but once she was awarded the Goncourt, Knopf acquired the rights to her book, which mentioned the prize uh, on the cover, as we saw. However, uh, one should note that NDI had moved from Minuit to Gallimard, which also increased both her chances to win the Goncourt and to be translated into English. Thus, the conditions of access of authors to the transnational literary field are unequal. Uh, this is also true for gender. Female authors account for 12 out of the, of the 114 uh, Nobel Prize winners, that is to say less than 10 percent. Seven of them uh, won it after 1990, as opposed to only five women during the first 90 years of the 20th century. Following its globalization from the 1960s onward, we thus observe a feminization of the world literary canon, coinciding with the inclusion of postcolonial authors. Nevertheless, all these authors are published in the centers of the global literary market, and those writing in central languages are still more likely to receive international recognition than those writing in peripheral languages. So to conclude, the study of the making uh, of word authorship requires, as I have tried to show, a sociology of the intermediaries who participate in the process, literary agents, publishers, translators, critics, writers, censors, and academics. These intermediaries intervene in the production and reception process. They contribute to the professionalization of authors, to the production of the value of their work, and to the making of their reputation. The position they occupy is unequal. Some are dominant, meaning, meaning they are endowed with a significant amount of symbolic capital and located in central countries and cities like Galima, which means that they have a high consecrating power. Others are dominated and local, located in peripheral places. Of course, there are dominant agents located in peripheral countries, but they may less, uh, they be less, they be they may be, sorry, less powerful in the transnational literary field than some dominated agents located in central cities. This unequal access to international recognition explains, explains why the world literary canon has been mainly composed of European and American writers until the 1960s. The opening of this canon to non-Western authors is due to the investment of Western intermediaries, publishers, agents, critics in the making of these authors in relation to the so-called globalization process and with the deconstruction of the canon by scholars in the 1980s. Fostered by the intensification of inter intercultural exchanges under the watchword of globalization, the transnational literary field unified around the notion of world literature which came to the fore in the 1990s. However, this notion should not mask the still unequal conditions of access to the world canon, which are socially determined. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
question and I think uh, it would be a research program to uh, organize uh, a reflection on these things. I have uh, some examples in, my, in mind. Uh, I've been working uh, on the circulation of uh, Hebrew uh, literature, modern uh, literature, and um, I can see how starting in the 1990s there are strategies of some authors to um, erase uh, more local um, uh, references and to put uh, forward uh, more, uh, you know, um, things like uh, terrorist attacks or a thing that would speak to a larger audience. Um, and that's an interesting thing. I just talked of, I, I won't mention her name, but uh, one of my friends, writer there, uh, and she was working on the translation of her book into English. And uh, she said, it's already translated into French, and she said, oh, I'm, I'm erasing all the local references. It's the translation, not the, the original book. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> why, why are you erasing that? She said, oh, it doesn't interest the, the, the public in the, in the English uh, Anglo-American uh, community. I said, but who, who, who said that to you? you know? And suddenly uh, she realized that uh, maybe she was doing uh, an error, but uh, the idea that she should uh, erase these local issues, there was political issues, there were very interesting issues that she was just, you know. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, in the same way that uh, you, you could compare uh, regional authors to national authors, uh, the, the, the kind of audience they addressed, trying to uh, focus on uh, things that would speak to, to everyone, we, couldn't, we can think of what would be the strategies. And um, when you speak about the 50s and the 60s, of course, that would be, uh, I'm uh, fortunately not specialist of uh, uh, Japanese literature, but I would be very interested in a study that would show uh, how writers, Japanese writers suddenly uh, change strategies uh, uh, addressing uh, another public. Uh, maybe that doesn't work for everybody, and uh, maybe there are authors who don't think of the audience and just think of their own uh, work, uh, but it would be a way of uh, you know, classifying uh, author strategies with regard to uh, the kind of um, uh, audience they can target. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure if I will be able to successfully formulate the question, but here is something that I can. Um, I'm, uh, your your, your uh, model of sociology of intermediaries actually reminded me of uh, Andrew Chesterman's own suggestion to move from translator uh, translation studies to translator studies. Uh, I wonder if you would be able to comment on that. And, and I'm actually particularly um, interested uh, with what you said about originality, uh, because as you know, originality is uh, a contested term in translation studies right now. Uh, I wonder if you would be able to extend what you were saying about the originality of the author to include the originality of the translator as well, and to regard the translator as an author uh, in his own right. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting uh, question. I think that's also uh, something that is under-researched, uh, and this is a fascinating uh, issue. Uh, there is a, the research program already exists. There is a paper by Daniel Simeoni about the translator's habitus, uh, who tries to think about uh, uh, how to apply the uh, sociology, uh, Bourdieu sociology of uh, uh, trajectories and uh, um, dispositions to translate I've done a bit of that. Uh, I've worked on the translators from uh, Hebrew literature and uh, trying to also connect uh, their um, 
uh, their choice of translation, their investment in translation uh, to uh, their uh, to, to the dimension of uh, cultural identity. Uh, how the, the way because there are different ways to become a translator uh, to acquire linguistic skills. Although not all translators have the linguistic skills, that's also an important point. But uh, um, the, the, there are two main ways. One is to learn the language. Uh, if the language is taught in the country where you are uh, raised, or the the uh, or studying, uh, and the other is immigration. So the issue of immigration appeared in uh, the research I did as very central to understand the investment of these uh, translators, who were um, most of them were not spe specialists of Hebrew literature at all. They were specialists of French literature or of literature of uh, other issues. But they became as they returned to France, they immigrated the two, uh, two, two ways, uh, they, they started investing in translation as a way to keep contact uh, with the uh, culture and uh, to probably also uh, val value uh, the, the symbolic capital they had acquired by the language. Uh, and of course, you can also study the translation strategies, uh, which I agree <coughs> cannot be reduced to domestication or to uh, um, uh, faithfulness, but this is an interesting uh, dimension of the norms also that are imposed by the publishers because there are also expectations. Translators don't act alone and they are much more submitted to the constraints of the publishers uh, than uh, the authors. Um, but uh, it also varies according to the segments we are speaking about. They are much more submitted in the commercial part of the publishing field. But you speak, I have been just uh, last week in a, on a conference, in a conference at Leeds on uh, the sociology of uh, translation of poetry. And uh, there, uh, you, you don't have uh, constrained by publishers, of course, because usually the translator is also a poet and is also a, a publisher uh, himself or herself. Um, and th there, there is a research that has been done on the profiles of uh, translators, so you have three kinds of uh, profiles. You have the, uh, the um, uh, writers themselves or poets, uh, you have professional translators and you have uh, academics. And the status of these translators are not the same. The, the, the piece they choose uh, are not the same. The, the professional uh, translators are much more submitted to the, the market demand because they, make, they earn a living out of translation. The academics usually uh, focus on classics, on works that are already valued. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the, the writers, uh, usually the way they practice translation is much more related to their own work. They choose pieces that they are in interested in. For instance, there has been uh, recently in France a retranslation of the Bible by uh, uh, writers and poets, so it's called the, the, the write, uh, La Bible des Écrivains, the Writer's Bible. Uh, most of them don't ha have uh, one word of Hebrew, but they have been working with specialists of Hebrew, and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful result, wonderful uh, book. Uh, so, so that's really interesting that uh, a lot of writers practice translation as a way to, to enrich themselves. They say that to, to enrich their own practice. And in this, in this context, of course, uh, and mentioned already for Baudelaire and translation of Paul, it could be considered as part of uh, the author's own body of work. And of course, uh, much more um, freedom is authorized uh, uh, to those authors than to professional translators. So that they are not submitted to, to the same expectation, neither by from publishers nor for the, from the uh, specialist of the work. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle, for a fine analysis. Um, my question would be, um, do you see, let's call it the modern technology, the modern media, television, internet, do you see having any influence in the story you told? Thank you. Thank Raine for uh, uh, an important question, which is also would need uh, a whole research program. Uh, of course, the, the technology has modified the circulation of text, and there are uh, a lot of um, uh, writers who try to develop uh, uh, public online publication. However, um, they are very cautious about. Uh, I mean, they are trying not to they, to, uh, to 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 keeping the professional publishing. So they, they, there are some part of the work that they publish this way, but the most important part is still uh, published by professional publishers, and it's only 
uh, writers who are already recognized who do this. For translation, um, there are attempts, uh, and there is a, a society of uh, uh, European society of authors, which uh, I'm part of the founding members of it, um, uh, who tries to value taking, you know, the idea of uh, Umberto Eco's uh, uh, sentence about the translation being the language of, the, of Europe. Um, so they developed um, uh, um, a tool, a technological tool, technological tool to allow translators to work uh, with other persons at the same time on a text. Uh, so the, the, the changes can be automatically done. So it, it's called club. Uh, I don't know if it has been much used for the moment, but the, the tool is amazing. Uh, I don't know much about uh, computer translation. Uh, I know that uh, Evan Zohar was fascinated with that since uh, uh, the mid 1980s. He was following the whole thing. Uh, I, I never trusted that because I'm uh, the same way. I, I'm a bit dubious about. I'm, I'm not afraid of uh, quantitative, but uh, lexicometry because uh, because of the complexity of semantics. Uh, but I've heard that for some lang languages it works better than for other. But I'm sure you know much better <laughs> about this than than I do. The only thing I know that uh, for my Arab on Facebook when there is the automatic translation, I don't understand anything. So, <laughs> so uh, um, things have uh, changed a lot, you know, and we are in a position or ready to give some sort of authorship to the translators. So my question is in relation to the author function of uh, Michel Foucault, you can say. In case of translated text, for a single text for if it is a one-way translation from A to B, for example, and if the translator himself, the writer, the writer himself is not the translator, in this case we will have two authors, for example. One is the author as originator, the author as translator. Naturally, by the extension of the concept of author function, we will have two types of author function here as well. So Taking this issue into account, how we can negotiate these two types of authorship in terms of author function, vis a vis a transnationalism. Yeah, thank you. So this was one of the questions I was trying to address, that uh, the transnational circulation of texts in different uh, language uh, modifies the concept of authorship, right? Uh, and we have to include the translator. And the translator is recognized the status of an author by uh, copyright laws. And also, uh, now more and more uh, in national bibliographies, in, in France, in the National Library, uh, the, the translator appears as one of the authors of the text, definitely. And I also try to say that the very status of the original that we think is the originally uh, uh, the, the, the text originally written by the author, uh, in some cases, uh, is not considered by the author themselves as, as the original. They prefer to have the, the translation as a reference uh, for the circulation of the, the work. Um, so, so I think it, it does uh, modify, uh, though uh, I've uh, interviewed a lot of uh, translators and I I talk with them a lot and I've been in many uh, meetings where th they talk uh, about their own profession. They, they never, they, they claim the status of author for uh, uh, social uh, conditions, recognition. Uh, in France there are low the royalties, which is not always the case uh, uh, in the United States, um, where there has been a deprofessionalization of uh, translation translators, and this is a big issue because this is the effect of the commercial constraints, right? Um, so, so the, 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 but still, they, apart, I think, from uh, writers who translate, uh, they don't claim to be the authors of the text. They still consider that uh, there is an author, uh, another author. But there are, there are tensions sometimes with, uh, between uh, an author and uh, a translator uh, that are very interesting. Sometimes the, the translator will say that the author does, doesn't understand, not master uh, well enough the language to be able to, uh, to tell whether the text is, uh, uh, is correct in the, uh, trans the translated <laughs> text is correct or not. And uh, we, I showed the example of Eta Marante discussing the translation of her text, but her French was good. And, and she also showed to, to friends. So, but 
the, the, there are struggles, so, so there is an issue. And for instance, in the U United States, where there is no moral rights for the author, uh, so the moral rights are assigned, uh, uh, the, the, the author is the translator. I mean, the author's uh, uh, point of view is just uh, doesn't count if it's not in the contract that he, he can say something about the translation or her, uh, the translation of uh, his or her text. Thank you so much for uh, so many interesting ideas. Um, uh, things are changing all the time, as uh, our colleague already said. I was thinking of that right now, reading uh, to the list on the screen, and think, thinking that maybe it would be still one more point. I mean, at this very moment, there are not only transnational writers, but transnational publishing houses. I mean, I don't know if you take this into account. Uh, such groups, uh, groups uh, such as uh, Bertelsmann, uh, for example. Yeah, thanks. That's an important point. So I, 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 I ended very briefly with the idea that despite the emergence of multinational uh, corporations, firms, um, still uh, we have the representation in the up market segment that there is a French literature, that there is an Italian literature, uh, that there is a German literature, which is of course uh, uh, absurd in some sense, right? Uh, and. Um, um, I don't know how much these conglomerates try to to blur it. So they they, they will blur it. Uh, in the case, for it's, it's not the conglomerate, but uh, the translation of uh, of Makin, uh, uh, which erases the French reference to the, the, the Testament Français. Uh, uh, it was a small publisher, but still, it was the idea to. Uh, to probably uh, erase the uh, the French hegemony in the literary field because this Russian guy uh, publishing in French, uh, Testament Francais, uh, it, it was a meaning for him, but this meaning was erased in the translation. Uh, so there are still also power relations between uh, uh, the countries. and. You, you speak about multinational corporation, but they, they are uh, uh, local firms, right? So I remember interviewing uh, uh, um, a, uh, one of these uh, uh, firms that belong to a large uh, uh, Spanish group, um, and the, the conditions are not the same. So they, they are allowed to publish some uh, local uh, Latin American authors, but uh, they are authorized to circulate them only in the country. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, circulate them in other Latin American country, they have to raise uh, to, to reach 40,000 copies, which is in not, uh, you cannot imagine that in, in, in the country I'm speaking of. I don't want to mention because uh, I don't want to, to the, 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 the editor I interviewed to, to be identified, but uh, uh, he and, and to be authorized to circulate these books in, in Spain, uh, you need to reach 100,000 uh, copies. This constraint does not apply to Spanish authors published by the uh, mother firm uh, in, in Spain. So there are power relations among the firms belonging to the same conglomerate, even when it's not a gathering, but it's a, a conglomerate with uh, branches, you know. Uh, and he spoke, he mentioned that he, s he spoke about cultural colonization. Uh, it was not economic, it was cultural. I was really intrigued by the trajectory you described from prefaces like, like the ones by Tony Davoshan and Anthony Mabel to the really just associative, um, or the Joyce meets, I forget the mention, um, both okay. as methods of transferring cultural capital. Um, but there's a difference. In the one case, there's content, in the other, it's pure association. Um, so, and linked to the slide you showed describing how. Um, these festivals are advertised and meet the author. Um, it, it seems like a movement from uh, content to uh, the magic of association or magic of contiguity, even. And um, as, I mean, it, it, the other connection I made was that um, this is good evidence of how capital accrues capital. Uh, cultural capital also accrues capital, cultural capital. And my question then is, um, did marketers simply discover that 
cultural capital, accrues cultural capital even without content, which the politicians, of course, have also discovered. I mean, has it, did they really, oh my God, that's always been the case, we don't have to pay anybody to write prefaces? Or did something actually change in the operation of capital and the operation of culture that made it, in fact, unnecessary to supply content where once something was supplied? Yeah, thank you uh, for a very, very interesting and intriguing question that I also ask myself, how, how did this happen to us <laughs> when you see these prefaces? And of course, you can think that it's a lot of work to get prefaces by authors. Authors don't have necessarily the time. At the moment, there were, more, uh, there were much less uh, uh, books in the market. Uh, now the production is such that uh, who would want to uh, wait to have the preface by uh, a writer, a famous writer who would not have the time to write it, uh, even though he would be paid. So for instance, the prefaces were also published in the journals. It's also the appearance of the, 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 the literary journals, uh, which is part of the story. They, they do exist, but they don't have the same uh, prestige. Uh, uh, so you had the, the newspapers who spoke about literature and the, the space for literature in newspapers is shrinking as well and and the content of it is more and more like you were describing more and more telling the story with big pictures of the writer uh, instead of uh, developing arguments about uh, uh, the form the, uh, the 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 way this work uh, the, the place of this work in the uh, in the author's uh, body of work and in the uh, literature literary tradition uh, she comes from or in the world literature, literature tradition. So I totally agree with uh, the fact that this evolution, I think this evolution is a kind of indicator of uh, the relative decline of literary capital uh, in the social sphere, which I observe also um, in other uh, places. It was observed uh, in a recent uh, research one of my colleagues, uh, sociologists, did about uh, the uh, the French elite today, comparing to what Bourdieu did in the 1960s, uh, the, the issue of cultural capital is declining. You have more and more the management uh, rising, the financial capital uh, rising. And um, some of these people do want to have some cultural capital, but then uh, it needs to be fast. And it's also about rhythm, acceleration of rhythm, uh, how to get the information, attention uh, uh, very quickly. and. Uh, yeah, blurbs, for instance, it's not without content. Sometimes it's a, a sentence taken from reviews that were written by uh, people. They're, they're, sometimes they are asked, but it takes time to write the, these blurbs and to find the right sentence. But I agree that this has nothing to do with a kind of uh, uh, analysis like Malraux doing, uh, uh, Faulkner, uh, do we agree or not on his analysis? Uh, it's it's a kind of uh, uh, reflection uh, which is more in depth, and uh, uh, so I think this has to do with the, the place of uh, of learned culture in our societies and uh, the way uh, it places shrink shrinking. There is still some prestige for it, but uh, it translates less and less in economic uh, capital. Uh, that's also something we can observe in the uh, book market. Um, when you look at the commercial part, and even in these conglomerates, uh, they, they try to, for instance, um, get rid of the, uh, the backlist, the backlist which was all the prestige of the publishers. Uh, having Faulkner in, in one's list is, is a kind of symbolic capital. But now many publishers consider that it's too much work to deal with, uh, you know, uh, furnishing the books, to providing the books to the uh, distribution points to the uh, to the chains and uh, uh, to have them. Uh, uh, so so they, they, you know, it's faster to have uh, books that uh, they are um, uh, just uh, fast. F f uh, sh sh uh, short sellers uh, uh, that are really, you know, they, they stay in the uh, bookstore for a few weeks and then uh, uh, we call it in French, uh, literature jetable. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask one question to pick up on the, uh, well, actually, pick, first on Peter's observation, I think we see an increase in preferences used to try to remarket backlist classics, right? Right. So Virginia Woolf will now have a preface by Mary Gordon. Contemporary novels. So now the so the classical canon hasn't completely disappeared, but gets transmuted uh, also. Uh, but I was just going to pick up on the other question about the media because I'm wondering if even in the mid 20th century, 
a film with a part of the internationalization of the book market. I'm thinking the Nouvelle Vague in France must have had some benefit for many French writers, or Kurosawa uh, for the Japanese writers. Did you see this starting already then? And does that sure. continue today? But even Faulkner, I mean, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, there was a, uh, a film that was uh, supposed to be done out of uh, Light of August, and it starts in the late 30s and comes from the uh, United States, I think. But uh, it's an argument for selling books, definitely. Um, for uh, the, in the case of Elsa Morante, uh, I, I could find that uh, uh, they, they decided it was one of the books that uh, they decided to acquire before they knew that uh, uh, Gallimard knew that there would be a, a film. But of course, the adaptation uh, of uh, literary texts uh, enhances the potential of selling uh, of, the, of the book. Uh, so that's of course uh, an issue. And also, perhaps more generally. If yeah. Japanese uh, film becomes famous, yes, yes, yes. Japanese Yeah, famous. so that's also what um, the, the second point I wanted to, to, to address. I understood uh, your question that indeed uh, in the 50s, uh, I haven't studied uh, the Japanese case uh, in itself, but I can see that there is uh, interest at the same time for the Japanese literature and for uh, Japanese film. Um, for Hebrew, for instance, I can see that there is more and more interest in, 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 in Israeli film, uh, though it was first here very clearly uh, for literature uh, much before, and also the film was not very interesting before a uh, recent period there, so uh, it also uh, can explain why uh, it did not uh, circulate, but it's of course not on the only uh, reason. Um, but uh, I, I agree that it's part of the exportation of a culture, so uh, literature and, and film, and more and more film uh, uh, which is easier to circulate than uh, literature. It takes less time to translate, and also uh, uh, if you find the good uh, networks, then uh, uh, so there is uh, an interesting research uh, that has been done uh, recently in France about the role of France in importing um, a very large diversity of uh, filmmakers from uh, uh, from uh, peripheral countries. Yeah, uh, Product, producting films from these countries. Um, so this is also a way uh, for France to affirm itself on this scene against uh, Hollywood, of course. The same way for translation. Uh, uh, but I, what I want to, to, to say about prefaces, uh, we were speaking about the translator as an author. Uh, so you can see that uh, when, uh, for instance, Lydia Davis, she, she writes a preface for her translation, a retranslation of Madame Bovary to explain the choices she's made. So here we have a, 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 a position, but they are not always allowed to do so. And uh, in the 50s, already Gallimard, they didn't want academics because they say, oh, the academics, they will want to write a preface and to make footnotes. We don't want this, you know. So from the commercial perspective, the idea that you have footnotes and uh, a preface is kind of, uh, uh, would be not appealing for the audience, uh, for large audience. Well, uh, yeah, thank you on behalf of the audience. This is very appealing.